As we announced last week, we are bringing a new study, a series, from the book of Ephesians. Basically, trying to answer some four questions which Paul doesn't raise, but it is implied over there. We are trying to study together as to who we are in God's sight. We are asked, and we are answering these following questions. Who are we? Why has God created us? Why has God placed us in the church? And what does God expect from us? We're going to look at each chapter of the book of Ephesians. And from each chapter, from Paul's point of view, we are going to come up with at least one identity as to who we are and what God expects from us. So last week we looked at Ephesians chapter 1, and we looked at verse 3 in particular. Praise be to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms. We are blessed people. God has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in Christ. With every spiritual blessing. Being blessed people, we concluded, we are called to be a very privileged people. And going down to verse 14, I share with you the sevenfold blessing with which God has blessed us. Today we are going to look at chapter 2 and verse 10 in particular. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. That will be our main focus. In this verse, Paul reminds us that we are called to be a productive people. We are God's workmanship, created to do good works in Christ Jesus, which He advanced, which, he, which God prepared in advance for us to do. As we look into this God's word, may we ask God's blessings upon our reading and our meditation. Let us pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity for us as your children to come to church every Sunday to worship and also to expose ourselves to the study of God's Word. And as you open our Bibles and meditate for the next few minutes at our disposal, this very Word of God, inspired by the Holy Spirit 2,000 years ago and written down by the Apostle Paul in this context, the Word of God that is so very meticulously preserved all these 20 centuries and being passed on from generation to generation, it's our privilege in this generation to be recipients of God's Word. Inasmuch as we attempt to meditate on your Word, we pray. As you inspire the Apostle to write the words, so you live into our understanding the meaning of your Word tonight. We pray that you create in our hearts a hunger for God's Word. It will create in our hearts a thirst for God's Word. For we understand the more we expect to hear from you, the more you will give it to us. Help us, O Lord, to keep us away from all distractions. Enable us to focus our attention completely on what the Word has to teach us tonight. To that end, we surrender ourselves to the ministry of God's Holy Spirit. And we pray this prayer with thanksgiving. In the blessed name of your Son, our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, and the people of God said, Amen. Amen. We are called to be a productive people. As way of a preparation, I want all of you to do one thing. I want you to open your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10. And I'm going to ask you a question, who are we? Then you are going to read that word, we are God's workmanship, and the whole sentence there. Shall we? Now let's ask ourselves, who are we? We are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. There are three observations we can make. Number one, who are we? We are God's workmanship. Number two, we are created in Christ Jesus to do good works, to be productive. Number three, this productiveness which God prepared in advance, God prepared in advance for us to do so. That's why last week we saw in Ephesians 1.4 that God chose us as in Him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in His sight. 
We are a chosen people even before the creation of the world. But God says we are chosen. Normally when you think of the word the chosen, we think of generally the people of Israel, the chosen people of God. But here in this episode, Paul is not just talking about the Israelites as the chosen people of God. He's talking about the Gentiles, which includes you and me. We are not Jewish. Is there anyone here this evening of Jewish ancestry? ancestry? Anybody? I don't think so. We are all Gentiles, non-Jewish community. But Paul says we are also chosen by him. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 to 9, he points out what kind of a life the Gentiles lived in the past. They lived in a social ethos and culture which was enchanted by all kinds of sin. But then he says, but God in his mercy chose us. He saved us and he raised us up with Christ. For if by grace you have been saved through faith and not from your own selves, it is a gift of God. Then again, in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 to 13, he again talks about that. Remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth are called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision. Remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of promise, without hope and without God. But now in Christ Jesus, you once who are far away have been brought near to the blood of Christ, and so on and so forth. So he's talking about the Gentiles as the chosen people of God. Why has God chosen us? To be productive. We are God's workmanship, created to do good, good works in Christ Jesus, which God prepared in advance for us. Let me make two observations here. Number one, the theological foundation of being good and some biblical models for doing good. Number one, the theological foundation for being good. In Ephesians 1, 4, we know that Paul says that God has chosen us in him before the creation of the world. In Ephesians 2, 10, he says that God has prepared us in advance for this very thing in order to do good works in Jesus Christ. I've said this story before and let me say it again by way of introduction. In case some of you did not hear it or have you heard it, we have forgotten it. Michelangelo, the great painter, was so famous and his work was so creative and so original. Even today, if you visit Vatican or Italy, any of those big cathedrals over there, looking at Michelangelo's paint, they say it looks as fresh and bright as if he only painted it yesterday, although he lived them centuries ago. What is the secret? Michelangelo paid meticulous attention to his art and painting. It says that every time he accepted an assignment to do painting, he would shut the whole building, door, not let anybody inside. He would spend weeks and months together doing the painting, going, over, going on and over and over again, making all the necessary corrections. Finally, when he is done, he would stand in front of the picture that he had just painted, a huge one, sometimes running from 30 to 40 feet across the wall, or sometimes above, right above your head on the door. He will, he will keep on looking at that intently from one angle. When he's perfectly satisfied by looking at it from that angle, he will knock himself and say, it's good. Then he move on to another angle, maybe to the right side. Now from the right side, you look at the picture intently. Take a few moments. And say, it's good. Then he moves on to the left side. From the left angle, he looks at the picture again. Same time, he spends time intently looking at every detail and say, it's good. Then you would step back about 10 feet, standing at the center, again looking at the thing, again the same ritual. It's good. So you spend so much of time going backwards, you know, until he reaches a vantage point beyond which you cannot see the picture with your naked eye. Having looked at it from so much of distance, from every angle, because his concern is when people walk into the hall or the cathedral, from wherever they are seated, whether that corner or that corner, in front or that way, in the center, from anywhere, when they look at the picture, everyone should be able to see the picture clearly and appreciate it. When he fully convinced that's exactly how he has done that, then he will open the door and let the visitors come in. The man was so thoroughly uh, meticulous about producing the best out of himself. He always wanted to give the best to the people who 
important to see because he was making a contribution to the church in terms of his, 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 his gift in painting, in, in doing arts. But that reminds us of what God did with us at the beginning of creation. As we go back to the book of Genesis and read the creation narrative there, the word of God says, all those six days, every time God created something, he would look at what he created, he saw it was good. Genesis chapter 1, verse 3. God saw that the light was good, 3 and 4. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 9, God saw the water and the sea that is created, it was good. Then in chapter 1, verse 12, God looked at the vegetation and the trees that is created, he saw it was good. In verse 19, he looked at the sun and the moon he created, he saw it was good. In verse 20, he, he looked at the birds and the sea creatures he had just created, he saw it was good. And then in verse 25, he looked at the animals and the reptiles that he had created, he saw it was good. Six days. Then after God finishes creating the human being, Adam, in Genesis 1.31, Having completed the creation of human being, God saw all that he had made and it was very good. There's an answer. Not just good, very good. What is that supposed to mean? It was God's intention when he created the humans that they would exhibit his goodness. When God looks at all of his creation today, it's a different story. When God looks at all of his creation today, he sees Many of them, much of them, still good, but only one category is not. When he looks at the sun and the moon and the stars, the hills and the hillocks and the mountains, the oceans and the rivers and the ponds, when he looks at the vegetation, the animals, the plantations, and you know, when he looks at all of them, God says still it is good. But can he say with confidence, when God looks at human beings today, that God feels it is good? Are humans exhibiting the goodness of God in which God has created us? In fact, God's greatest and the only regret ever, ever expressed is in the book of Genesis chapter 6, verses 5 and 6. This was the context of the flood of Noah, Noah's time. Genesis 6, 5 says, The Lord saw how great man's wickedness on the earth had become, and that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all the time. The Lord was grieved that he had made man on the earth and his heart was filled with pain. Friends, remember that our God whom we worship is a God of emotions. If you have emotion, I have emotion. If we feel grieved and we have a pain in our heart, both physically and emotionally, our God is a God of God feelings. He is not an impersonal God. When God looked at the humans, he grieved his heart. His heart was filled with pain. That's what the Bible says. Because instead of exhibiting God's goodness, humans were only exhibiting their own wickedness. And every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all the time. Way back in 1980, I had the privilege to go to a a big city called Pattaya in Thailand for a World Congress on Evangelism as part of a 40-member delegation from India. Thailand is just one small nation and Pattaya is one small town. In that one small town, in one small street, one single incident took place that hurt me deeply. I always thought about it. Well, afternoon, we didn't have much to do, so some of us, including a very respected Honorable Bishop. Maybe I said this story before, maybe not. We just went out. This Bishop is a good friend of mine. He said, Tami, let's go. So I went with him. We went to the particular street. We were doing some little shopping. Mostly we were looking for some souvenir to take back home. And there are some young women over there. They look very friendly, very smiling, very charming. And this Bishop is an outgoing, friendly Bishop. I've known him for this. Although he was Bishop of the Madras Diocese, which is one of the biggest dioceses of the churches of India. He was a street evangelist. He would always talk to somebody about Jesus. So when he saw these young ladies smiling and friendly, he walked up to them and began to share the gospel. 
And I was standing there suspecting nothing, listening to this bishop sharing the gospel. And the instant one of the girls suddenly began to pull him towards herself, he was shocked and he was trying to get rid of but she wouldn't let him go. And she began to our horror, we found out within seconds, she was a prostitute. Now can you imagine, we come from a tradition, we mark them out, CSI, or Methodist, how much we respect our Philippines. How much we respect our bishops. They are, to us, they are the spiritual leaders, right? Maybe we are so humble in their presence. So that's why I look at But that girl was pulling him because she thought he was a potential customer. When he realized he was an order, this great man of God, he was literally shivering at him. So some of them to physically pull him out of that girl's hand and take him Going back, he was literally shivering. Shock and a great shock. It took some time for him to revive and himself and get back. And that night, when he went to dinner, none of us could eat. He could not eat, I could not eat. My, my stomach was sick. But what he saw, the, we heard about prostitution. They tell stories about the red light area in Calcutta or Bombay. It's just hearsay, you know. I don't see it in my own eyes. Here we saw it. Even a respectable spiritual leader of the congregation of the church, a big denomination, is not spared from this kind of a wickedness. And those girls are laughing. That evening, I was listening with a friend of mine, who was then the director of the Youth for Christ in India, Sam Dyson in his name. And as we are telling this story, he told Brother Martin, you know, you are so deeply Paint by one incident we saw, then he went on to tell me something. What would God be feeling, Brother Martin? You, you witnessed one incident today, one incident of wickedness, and you are not able to take it. You are in a shock. But look at God. When God looks at the huge world today, He is looking at 6.2 billion people, which has got more than 180 or 200 nations. And he's looking at thousands of cities and towns and villages. And he's looking at millions of streets and roads and residential areas. And he's looking at billions of individuals and most of them exhibiting similar kinds of wickedness. How would God take it? Think about that, my brother. That I thought of Genesis chapter 6. Can you imagine, my friend, tonight then? When God looks at the world today, maybe in the time of Noah, the global population was just about a few hundred thousand people. That was it. Just a few hundred thousand people in Noah's days. Today, it is 6.2 billion people. But wickedness has not gone down. It has never been in recession. We talk about economic recession. But there's no sin in recession. In this wicked world, can you imagine the pain and the grief and the agony in the heart of God even today? Therefore, Ephesians 1 4 becomes challenging and relevant to us. In this wicked world, God chose us in Him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in His sight. And in this wicked world, God has made us be His workmanship to do good works in Jesus, which He prepared in advance for us to do. What a confidence that he's looking up to us, that some of us, so-called Christians in the church, that some of us at least would bring glory and honor to God. Some of us would bring joy and happiness to God by doing the good works he has called us to in a world of wickedness all around us. Therefore, the repeated reminder Maybe the reinforcement in the entire New Testament of a call to be pure and productive. Numerous references. Let me quickly read some of them to you. In Matthew 5, 16, Jesus said, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and praise your Father in heaven. In Matthew 5, 44, He said, Do good to them who hate you. Pray for them who persecute you. Bless them who curse you. In Romans 12, 9, Paul says, Hate what is evil, cling to what is good. In 1 Corinthians 10, 24, he says, Nobody should seek his own good, but the good of others. 2 Corinthians 9, 8, God is able to make all grace upon to you, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will be a few of all in good works. 
in Galatians 6.10, Ephesians 2.10, Colossians 1.10, 1 Timothy 6.18, 2 Timothy 3.16-18. Everywhere the call of God is for us to do good works. I just don't have the time. Then finally, as the book ends, the book of Revelation, this is the closing word of God in Revelation 22, 11-12. Let him who does wrong continue to do wrong. Let him who is vile continue to be vile. Let him who does right continue to do right. Let him who is holy continue to be holy. Behold, I am coming soon. My reward is with me. And I will give to everyone according to what he has done. Book of Genesis to the book of Revelation. The entire scripture reminds us that we have been chosen by God to do good works in Him, in Jesus Christ. That is the theological foundation. Why? We should be good. Secondly, there are several biblical models for doing good. Of course, the greatest model for doing good is Jesus Christ Himself. As we read in Acts 10, 10 38, the, testi the, the testimony is that Jesus went about doing good. What is it supposed to mean? He went about it. Wherever he went, Jesus was only doing good. Whether it's a city or a village, he went to a house or to the temple, he went about doing good. And in John 7, 12, people said, he is a good man. And besides Jesus, I'm surprised that besides Jesus, only a handful of people being referred to honorably as people who are either being good or something doing good. For example, one man was referred as a good man beside Jesus was Joseph of Arimathea. In Luke chapter 24 and 50, he was the one who went to Pilate and asked him to give the body of Jesus that he can give a decent burial. And the word of God says in Luke 24, 50, Joseph of Arimathea, a member of the Sanhedrin of the council, was a good and upright man. And then in Acts 9, there is a woman, Tabitha, Tabitha, uh, who was also called darkness, the word of God says she was always doing good. Then indirectly a reference to Cornelius in Acts chapter 10 and verse 2. He and all his family were devout and God-fearing. He gave generously to those in need and he prayed regularly. Then finally the fourth man, Barnabas. In Acts 11 and verse 24 it says he was a good man full of the Holy Spirit. But not this. Maybe I'll have it one of the references. Just a handful of people in the entire New Testament known for being good or doing it. Just a handful of people. No wonder Apostle Paul repeatedly in episode after episode after episode insists and reinforces our call to be productive. That we are created in Christ Jesus to do good works. Of course in the church today including our own church here. All over the world, the church universal, there are a lot of good people. I believe that good people in every church outnumber those so-called bad people. But what is our concept of goodness? Maybe some people just look at this one verse in the scripture and they think as long as they do it, they are okay. In one sense, yes, but not in all sense. For example, many people think being good is what? 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 11 describes. What does 1 Thessalonians 4.11 say? Make it your ambition to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business, and to work with your own hands, just as we told you, so that your daily life may win respect of outsiders, so that you will not be dependent on anybody. That's a good thing, isn't it? There are four good things about this. Who are the good people? People who lead a quiet life. There are a number of us do that in the church all over the world. Number two, people who mind their own business. There are a number of Christians who mind their own business. They never poke their nose in the affairs of the other people. They don't say one word, bad word about anybody. They go about doing their own business. Good. Number three, they work with their own hands. Wonderful. The number of Christians, including many of us here, we work with our own hands. Number four, so that we win the respect of outsiders. For there are many of us here right here, we win the respect of outsiders. We are well respected in the places where we work, among our colleagues, our associates, our neighborhood. We are well respected. Good. Finally, fifthly, the 
are not dependent upon anybody. Number of you are like that. Almost everyone of you like that. You are not dependent upon anybody. It's good. Everything is good. But being good only in that five times is not good enough. Being good is not good enough in the sight of God. We are commanded to doing good. There are several biblical models for doing good within the church and outside the church. Let me give you one within the church. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 20 and 21, the Apostle Paul talks about the great opportunity for us to doing good within the body of Christ, the body of Christ, the church. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 20, in a large house there are articles not only of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay. Some are for noble purposes and some for ignoble. If a man cleanses himself from the latter, he will be an instrument for noble purposes, made holy, useful to the master, and prepared to do any good work. Paul is talking about being and doing good work within the body of Christ the church. There are four important observations that Paul makes in these two, three verses. Number one, we are created for a purpose. In large house, there are articles not only of gold and silver, but also wood and clay, some for noble and for some ignoble purposes. We are created for a noble purpose, number one. Number two, we are created to be pure in verse 21. If a man cleanses himself, that's purifying. If a man cleanses himself from the latter, he will be an instrument for noble purpose. The noble purpose cannot be achieved unless we are willing to purify ourselves. That's the same thing he talks about. We have been set apart to be holy and blameless. See the internal and inevitable connection between being holy and being productive. And number three, he talks about productivity in verse 21. If a man cleanses himself, he will be an instrument for a noble purpose, made holy, useful to the master. God wants us to be useful to him. And finally, that we should be prepared to do any good work. So four observations. There is a purpose. There is a call for purification. There is a call for productivity. And there is a call for preparedness. Note. Useful to the master and prepared to do any good work. Any good work we should be prepared to do. The question each member of any church therefore should be asking is this. If I am called to be productive. If I am God's workmanship. Created in Jesus Christ to do good works and advance and prepare in advance. The question I should be asking tonight is, am I ready and willing to serve the noble purpose God is calling me to serve within the household of God, the church? Number two, am I ready and willing to purify myself in order to serve the noble purpose God is calling me to serve within the household of God, the church? Number three, am I ready and willing to be productive and useful to the master within the household of God, the church? And finally, am I prepared to do any good work God is calling me to do within the household, the body of Christ, the church? Any good work. When it says any good work, it includes even simple things that go totally unnoticed. Any good work refers to simple things that never gets praised or recognized or applauded within the body of Christ. Let me close with this illustration. We all know that Mother Teresa was a great servant of the church, especially in the 20th century. We all know that she was a Nobel Prize winner, a Nobel laureate. We all knew that she was a globally accorded missionary. We all knew that Christians respected Mother Teresa even across their denominational barriers, boundaries. And even non-Christians across their religious boundaries respected her. We knew her to be someone great. Once a journalist asked Mother Teresa as to what, where she found her great challenges and enormous satisfaction. Her response was, that she found great challenges and enormous satisfaction in doing simple acts of goodness and kindness to people. She said, People say I am doing a great work. No, I don't. And she said, In fact, I 
I'm just a pencil in the hands of God. How insignificant she could be. I'm just a pencil in the hands of God. You know, in the digital, electronic age, and the world of information technology in which we live today, who cares for a pencil? This is a children's stuff, isn't it? When Mother Teresa compared herself to a pencil. Yet there are very interesting and most significant observations we can make of a simple pencil and what it can accomplish in terms of what Timothy, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, 20 to 21, in terms of the purpose of the pencil, like a pencil we can perform. In terms of the purification that God wants us, calls us to cleanse ourselves, in terms of being productive and useful in the hands of the Master, in terms of being prepared for God's work. <coughs> Incidentally, about a year or so ago, there was a gentleman, you remember? Some of you, there was a Ugandan team of young people who came and performed, and there was a young preacher who also brought out the pencil. You remember that? Do you remember all that he said? Do you? Yeah. Let me let me repeat that for you, that uh, close to that one. And I'm going to connect that with the words that we read. Number one, the pencil reminds us of, in terms of the purpose. In terms of purpose, the pencil is a small tool for writing. Right? The pencil is a small tool for writing. Yet, it can write great books if used by a great writer. This can write a great book if it is used by a great writer. And the implication is, if you are willing to be a small pencil in God's hands, He can use you to write great chapters in the history of the church. Are you willing? Number two, in terms of purity, you know the pencil has got two parts at this to begin with. An inside part, the black thing we call it what? The lead, is that it? And then the outer part, they come with bright and beautiful colors in, in yellow and red and green and whatnot. <coughs> no matter how bright and brilliant and beautiful the color of the pencil on the outside may be, it will be utterly useless if the inside lead is missing or not intact. What is the implication? No matter how impressive you may look on the outside with your assuming education, expertise, status, wealth, so on and so forth. If your inside, your very heart is not right with God, then you will be utterly useless in the household of God. For pure is your heart in order to do good works and God Number three, in terms of productivity, if the pencil is not sharp enough, it cannot make a clear mark. If the pencil is not sharp, it cannot make a clear mark. A blunt lead needs to be sharpened from time to time in order to be used effectively. The implication is you need to let the Holy Spirit sanctify you time and time again so that he can be sharpened by him and be useful to the master any time. If not, you will only remain blunt and useless all the time within the household of God and church. <coughs> Finally, in terms of preparedness, the pencil, because most of them, come with an attached eraser, is that right? And what is the eraser for? Whenever you make a mistake, you take the eraser and rub it out, correct the mistake and rewrite all over again. The implication is, you should be prepared to do any good work by your willingness and humility to be corrected, to erase any and all mistakes as prompted by the Holy Spirit, are you willing? That is simple. If Mother Teresa could say she was only a pencil in the hands of God, that's the least we can be in the hands of God. Not to be a big electronic gadget, not to be a computer in the hands of God, but just to be a simple pencil in the hands of God. Because we are created to do good works in Christ Jesus. One more time, I'm going to ask you, who are, not who are we, but I'm going to ask you, who are you? And you are going to read Ephesians 2.10 out loud, 
This time you are not going to say, we are God's workmanship. You are going to personalize it in the first person singular. You are going to respond and say, I am God's workmanship, created by Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for me to do. Would you do that please? I am going to ask you one more time in closing. Who are you? I am God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for me to do. Would you please stand for the closing prayer and the benediction? Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this very powerful reminder that has come from the pen of Apostle Paul. Inspired by the Holy Spirit, written specifically for the members of the church at Ephesus, reminding them of their higher calling in Christ Jesus. In chapter 1, he told them, reminded them that they are called to be a privileged people, having been blessed in the heavenly places with all spiritual blessings. What a privilege! Not only they, even we have been blessed with the same privilege. And in chapter 2, he reminded them that they are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good work, prepared in advance for them to do so. Not only then, the same reminder comes to us. We too are included. We too have been created, every one of us, including me, the preacher tonight. Every one of us has been created, oh God, as your workmanship, created to do good works in Christ Jesus. And you prepare us in advance for us to do so. We thank you for the reminder. And we submit ourselves to that reminder. Help us to do good. As John Wesley once reminded his disciples, his followers, do all the good you can to all the people you can. In all the means you can. In all the ways you can. At all the times you can. As long as you ever can. Help us to do good to one another. Help us to do good to people around us. Help us to do good even those who hate us, persecute us, and curse us. By doing good work, as Jesus said, that people see the good works that we do and glorify our Heavenly Father. To that and bless us and use us. For this we pray with thanksgiving in Christ's name. Amen.